Hi, this is Father Bill W. here in Austin, and uh, welcome to the podcast today. Um, I hope you've had a chance to visit our website. It's called Two Way Prayer, and it contains lots of information about the uh, the prayer practices that uh, were really helpful, tremendously helpful to the people in early AA, and they came from the Oxford group. Um, I kind of stumbled onto those about 26 years ago, and it uh, truly changed my life and has been changing the lives of uh, many, many other people since then. So I hope you'll do that. And uh, the other thing I'd ask you to do is to uh, start following us on uh, Father Bill W. on Facebook and uh, put postings up there pretty regularly and would love to hear some feedback from you on uh, how you're doing with uh, with the program. We're doing a step series on the steps right now. This is a 12-step series, and we are uh, up to step four. We're looking at it in a slightly different way, though. You know, everybody's got their opinion on uh, the 12 steps, and uh, I've got mine, and maybe you have yours as well. Um, I'm not too interested in that, not even too interested in my opinion, uh, but I am interested in how did the pioneers approach this, uh, because they had a recovery rate that was far higher than the one we're seeing today. And my belief is that we're complicating uh, the steps uh, tremendously. They can be a lot easier. I'm a big fan of Dr. Bob, and his advice was keep this thing simple. So um, that's the way we're approaching it. We want to uh, look at the fourth step. But um, uh, before we do that, just a quick uh, two-minute review on how we got to this point in the program. So each each time I start... Uh, doing a step, talking about a step, I'm going to do a two-minute uh, review of, of what led up to it, because I don't think you can really begin with it in isolation. The steps are like dominoes. If you, if you, if you approach them that way, they're very logical. They fall into place uh, rather quickly and easily, and, and most importantly, understandably. So here, here's the review. Uh, we start with, with step one, and the, the, the thing I want, I want us to recognize in step one is an element of hopelessness, that if you're an addict like me and, and you tried getting sober and uh, your own efforts uh, just couldn't work for you, um, then, then you're ready to try a different path. So that, that experience of hopelessness, the experience of defeat with our addiction actually turns out to be one of our greatest assets. We've tried this thing our way. And that's what the big book says. You know, it says, go, if you're not convinced, go ahead out there and try some more controlled drinking and see how successful you are. And the reason they said that is because they knew without that conviction that, uh, that I by myself can't do this thing, the program really isn't going to work. So if you have that, <clears throat> if you failed, congratulations, um, I did too. And that's, that's the beginning point for everybody. Second step, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, that there exists or at, at least could exist a power that could do for me what I can't do for myself. That's step two, and it's really, really simple. They would usually ask people, is there possible, is it possible there could be a God? And if there were a God, could God do for you what you can't do for yourself? Two positive answers to that, and you're ready to ready to go on to step three. And step three was in the presence of another person, you asked this God who could exist uh, for help. Um, usually did it on their knees, um, not mandatory, but uh, I found that helpful myself. Uh, put myself uh, physically in the position where my heart was was uh, was coming from. So that's step three. Now, what I want to say about the first three steps, and we, we kind of touched on this in the last podcast, was uh, you can group the steps, and by grouping them, I think you get a clearer indication of what the process is about. Um, so in the first three steps, what we are doing is forming a connection, 
a connection with God. Here I am, alone, isolated, helpless, hopeless. Uh, but now if I can connect to this power that I need in my life, things are going to change. So one, two, three, connection. Now, the next set of steps that we're starting uh, with this podcast have to do with correction. What are the things that I have to change in my life in order for that connection to be successful? Uh, if you kind of think of spirituality as a substance, you know, uh, we've got a physical disease, we've got a mental disease, uh, and the, and the solution that we are following here is a spiritual solution. So if you can begin to think of spirituality almost as if it were a substance, all right, it needs to begin flowing into me. The power uh, is what I need uh, from God, the power to stay sober, the power to be sane, the power that... Uh, that uh, lack of power, which the book says, that is our dilemma. We don't have it. We got to get it from a source outside of our usual way of operating. So if you think of it as a substance and it's coming into you, what are the blockages that exist in us that keep that power from coming through in the way that it should? You know, if, you, if you've ever looked at an old pipe um, that, that connects the, the main water line into the house, and it's gotten corroded. Uh, there's a wonderful image for, for this next uh, set of steps. We're going to clear the blockage, the, uh, all the calcium and the, and the stuff that has gotten into those pipes and is keeping the water from coming into the, into the house. Um, Frank Bookman who started the Oxford group and uh, who really developed the, you know, most of the steps. Uh, he talked about working with constipated Christians, you know, uh, constipated Christians. There's, there's another image uh, that you can use uh, if you want to go there, that, that, that there should be a flow that's, that's happening in me. And if I'm constipated, it ain't flowing, you know? So, so what are the things that are going to come into my life to begin begin changing me so that I can correct what is wrong inside of me. Um, let me start with an example because uh, Frank Bookman um, made a terrific discovery. And this was uh, back in the early part of the 1900s or so. He, uh, he had a fight with his board of directors. Uh, he was he was in Philadelphia. He was helping young men uh, who were really down and out, and he was feeding them and clothing them and, and providing shelter for them in a home. And he had a board of directors, and the board of directors had a meeting one night. They came to his house, and they said, Frank, you're spending much too much money feeding these guys. We want you to cut down on your food budget. And Frank, uh, like many of us, had an ego. And uh, it puffed up, and he basically told those guys where they could go. He quit his job, and he went over to uh, England, borrowed money from his parents, uh, who were, they were codependent, I guess, and, um, and, he, and he set sail over to England. But what he learned in the time between he qu the, when he quit that job and, and when he got to England, he recognized something that is tremendously important. And it goes back to this blockage thing. He recognized that the resentment that he had towards those six guys on his board of directors was keeping him from an experience of God's grace. There was a blockage in his heart. There was a blockage in his life. All right. And that was the resentment that he held towards them. So he has an experience, just like Bill Wilson had an experience, wherein he surrendered. And then he went and uh, recognized that while there were six guys on that board and, and they were wrong, and, and he believed they were wrong, he was also wrong. 
he called himself, I was the seventh wrong man. And that's, that's what this inventory process is really about, recognizing my own contribution, how I am getting in the way of God's grace. And, you know, uh, Dr. Bob said, uh, you know, much of, the, much of the program came to him out of Scripture. And this one is uh, the scriptural passage in the Sermon on the Mount where it says, Take the log out of your own eye before you go and try to get the speck out of your brother's eye. So that, that's, that's, that's the owning of our part and then the forgiving of, uh, of others. And ultimately, maybe the most difficult one, uh, at least in my case, has been forgiving myself for that uh, as well. So that's the, the part of the, just the beginning of the correction phase that we're uh, entering into here and starts with the, uh, the fourth step. So um, what, are, what are we trying to get at here? Well, a, little, a, little, uh, a little review of some psychology might be helpful. It, it certainly was to me in, in understanding what the process is about. And, and um, it starts with, with uh, we talk in, in 12-step a lot about our ego. Um, and and um, I, I want to introduce a couple of other terms to you that uh, might be helpful in understanding how that ego operates. Because that ego is really a filter through which uh, reality is going to come, come to me, come into my mind. Ego sense simply means my sense of self. It's a Latin word. Ego, I, means I. But which I am I talking about? And this is, this is the thing where addicts really, really start to see the need for the, for the spiritual solution to the problem. And the solution is a, a, a new I that is coming into existence. Okay? So a couple of terms. Number one is the persona, uh, fancy, fancy term. It really kind of means the mask, the image that I put onto myself. And we all do this. You know, we're brought up uh, uh, in, a, in a home, and from some of our earliest days, we are taught, this is not good, this is not right, don't be that, Okay. Don't say this, don't think this, don't do this. Uh, but a part of me wants to do those things, okay? Uh, so what do I do? I want to be liked, I want to be loved, I want to fit in. And so society is going to teach me, um, not always real successfully, that uh, this is not right. So that stuff, where do I put that stuff? Another image might be helpful. I put it in my basement. I, I, I stuff it down below. You know, you really, I'm really angry. Well, don't be angry. Okay, I'm not angry. The hell I'm not. I'm rageful. But I'm smiling. Okay? So where does that stuff go? It goes into the basement. And Jung called that part of ourselves the shadow the unacceptable parts that get pushed down. So what I'm really going to start doing now in this fourth step is um, I'm going to begin to take my mask off and I'm going to start looking inside, looking deep inside so that I can begin to see some of the shadow parts, some of the parts of me that I have not wanted to look at prior to this. And this is going to take some courage. No, make no mistake about that. Um, and that's why uh, hang on to the fact that you're just connected with all power and all love who is going to help you doing this process, who is going to show you the things that you need to see about yourself. And part of the shadow this is really important. Part of the shadow, the hidden part of me, the stuff that I've stuck in the basement, is my own light. 
Uh, some of the best parts of me, alcoholics and addicts, and we can't even see those. Other people can see them, but we are blind to them. All right. So this, there is a payoff to this. It, it ain't just pulling up all the junk. It's also, it's pulling up the junk so that the light, the beautiful person that you are, can begin to shine through. Um, somebody said uh, uh, that God loves our shadow more than he loves us. I remember the first time I, I read that, it was like, what, what are we talking about here? God loves our shadow more than he loves us. Well, after thinking about it for a while, the answer that came to me is because, because it's more real. It's more real. You know, who did Jesus hang out with? He's hanging out with prostitutes and tax collectors, uh, thieves. If there were addicts back then, man, they were in. He, he was hanging out with them. Why? Because, because he loved their behavior? No, because they weren't carrying this mask that said, Oh, I'm hot stuff. Uh, the, 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 they were too in touch with, uh, with what was troubling them. Um, and that's actually a great asset. So, so they were more ready to change, to hear the message, uh, than was, um, you know, the Pharisees, the scribes, and all, all the holy people. You know? Um, so... Um, again, again, back to uh, our greatest asset is the mess we've made of our lives, because um, that's going to open me up to the fact that uh, I really do need help, and I, I do need to change, and um, that change needs to come from a source outside of me. Okay, hope that makes some sense. So how do we approach this? Well, the way, the way we do it is uh, we've got to look at one, uh, one word that, that's probably going to trouble us a little bit, a searching and fearless moral inventory. That's what the step says. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. So we're going to have to look at our morals. Um, sorry about that, but, <laughs> but that's what the step is about. And uh, I want to give you another quote from Bookman because you're going to hear the big book uh, right, right coming through this thing loud and clear. Bookman said, moral recovery starts when everyone admits his own faults instead of spotlighting the other fellows. What is our real problem? The symptoms may differ. The disease remains the same. What is the disease? Isn't it fear, dishonesty, resentment, selfishness? We talk about freedom and liberty, but we are slaves to ourselves. See, that's the thing about that persona, that mask. If you're hanging on to that as yourself, you know I knew I was a liar. I was a liar. And that's why the honesty thing is so extremely important in, in, in the recovery process. You know, if, if we can't, you know, that's why Big was said, if you're constitutionally incapable of being honest with yourself, this thing isn't going to work. We've, and we all think, well, maybe I'm constitutionally incapable. No, 99.9% .9 of people are not incapable. We may be scared to death, but we're not incapable of doing it. So we have to begin facing the, the blockage. In the Oxford group, they called that sin. Now, that's a, a word, the S word you never hear in a 12-step thing, and probably good, good because we've, uh, we've kind of really distorted that image. Uh, but, you know, interestingly, when they wrote sin, when they wrote the word sin, oftentimes they would write a small S, a great big I, and then a small N. So it's that inflated eye, that big eye, that distorted sense of self. That's what has to be cut down to right size. What is sin? Uh, Wilson couldn't, couldn't bring himself to use that. He knew alcoholics would, would, uh, <laughs> would run when they heard that word. So he used character defects, shortcomings. He later said, 
I'm talking about sin. I'm talking about, and what is sin? Sin is anything. Catch this definition because it, it's real simple and, and, and can, I think, be really helpful. Anything that separates me from God, anything that separates me from God, anything that separates me from other people, all right? Anything that separates me from my true self, it's blockages. What are the blockages? So that's why we're having to do this journey. That's why we're having to go inside, go down in that basement, and begin bringing up, bringing into light some of the things that I, man, I was trying to push those suckers down and keep them down. But the problem with that is <laughs> they get out. They get out sideways, you know? I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Uh, you know, I remember in my drinking, you know, sometimes I do something really not, not characteristic of my mask. And, um, and, and, and the expression I would use, well, you got to forgive me, uh, Joe. I just wasn't myself yesterday. You know, until Joe says, well, then who the hell were you? <laughs> you know, it wasn't myself. Yeah, I was myself, but I was a part of myself that I have stuffed down, um, tried to stay away from uh, until it cracks, you know, and, and, and hopefully it cracked when you began your first step. Now we're going to take that crack and ply it open a little bit further so we can look down into that basement and see what's going on there. Now, uh, you, you got to remember the, the people in, in the Oxford group, uh, they didn't have steps. Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob, first 100, when they got sober, didn't have steps. But they did have a process. And the process was pretty similar, um, but perhaps simpler. And, and I want to focus on that because, uh, you know, the, the big book method uh, uh, and, and lots of inventories. I've seen inventories, some go on 50 pages or more of here's the process, answer this question, and then that question, and then another question. I don't know about you. Maybe that's helpful for you. If it is, good, go for it. Uh, but it didn't work for me. Um, what did work for me was taking the big book and trying to distill it down to exactly what they said they did, and then, and then do that in, in, in my own inventory taking. Um, so what do they do? They break it down into basically three things. We look at our resentments. We look at our fears and we look at our sex behavior. And then they have the three column thing. If that works for you, uh, go ahead and do it. Um, but there was a different method that they have. They didn't have that three column deer deal. We, we're not exactly sure where Wilson got it. I have not been able in, in my studies to, to find a very specific thing. There were some references to businesses uh, taking inventory, uh, looking at stock and trade, seeing what's good, seeing what's not. There, there were some references to that. But the three column specifically, uh, I've not been able to find that. Um, but, but if you look at it, what the three column is there to do is to help me get in touch with my part of the deal. And that was very, very much um, uh, the Oxford Group experience out of Frank Bookman uh, taking responsibility for himself. The danger of some of this stuff, though, is, um, you know, in my work in the, in the addiction field and uh, as a priest, I've, I've listened to a good number of uh, fifth steps. And uh, some of the ones that are uh, done with the three uh, three column inventory thing. Some of them can go on and on and on and miss the essential elements. Um, see, I think what the, if, if this is, this is where if studying the, the pioneers can be helpful, uh, that's what I'm interested in. So they had a simpler method. Um, and, and I, that's what I want to present to you so that you uh, have a basic understanding of that. And, and their method goes back to the 
four absolutes. The honesty, the purity, the unselfishness, and the love. They said, that's who God is. And, and what I want to do, what I need to do, is look at my life from, that, from those standards. Am I honest? Am I pure? Am I unselfish? Am I loving? And the answer for all of those guys and women was, no, I'm not. You know? But that's the standard that they set for themselves. So how did they approach this inventory process, this self-examination? Oh, so here's Sam Shoemaker, head of the Oxford Group in the United States, the guy who helped Bill Wilson uh, uh, figure out the, the steps. And he says this, it would be a very good thing if you took a piece of foolscap paper, a yellow legal pad, and wrote down the sins you feel guilty of. One of the simplest and best rules for self-examination that I know is to use the four standards, which Dr. Robert E. Spear said represented the summary of the Sermon on the Mount. Absolute honesty, absolute purity, absolute unselfishness, and absolute love. Review your life in their light. Put down everything that doesn't measure up. Be ruthlessly, realistically honest. So, uh, the way they approached the, uh, the inventory part, and, and, and each of them, <coughs> excuse me, had to do this. They would sit down, sometimes with their sponsor, <coughs> sometimes with, uh, um, by themselves. But they would, they would go into their hearts and look at what is it that they're ashamed of? What is the stuff that's really getting in the way of their relationship with God? And that is the thing that, that every addict who wants to recover has got to do. We have to look at ourselves. You know, they say there's no admission price for uh, the program. Not true. <laughs> this, is, this is where, when I really start facing one of the big ones, that, um, that I, I must begin this journey. And, and I, I do want to make it simple. Um, I, I don't think this is analysis. Um, I think this is honesty. See, I knew the stuff I had done, said, felt, thought that I was not going to share with other people. I knew that. And I, and I was spending a great deal of energy pushing that stuff down. How I felt about me. All right. How I felt about what I had done. It, 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 it was the cheap, mean, petty little stuff inside of me. It was the shameful sexual stuff that, that ain't talking about this, you know, uh, that all of us uh, have and try to hide. Uh, that's the stuff. And, and whatever method you use to get to that, uh, that's th the beginning of this recovery process. Uh, shame is, I think, the biggest one. Um, um, <laughs> write the damn stuff down in code if you have to. Um, one of the things I've found helpful is don't even plan to share it. Take the steps one at a time. So I'm going to do this now the next thing will be getting the courage to share it. But when you're doing it, do it as if you're not going to share it. You're never going to share it. It's your inventory. Uh, you know the stuff. Uh, and, and, and that's what you need to, to begin getting up from that basement. One of the good things uh, about doing it the, the Oxford Group way, the pioneer way, if you understand... <clears throat> where these steps were coming from. You only have to do this thing once. I have done one fourth step. And that's what my uh, sponsor told me. You do this thing once, but you do it completely. And completely doesn't mean getting every single little thing I've ever done wrong uh, or right. It, it, is, it isn't that, that 
huge 50 page list. It's getting the stuff that makes me feel separate from other people, separate from myself, divided uh, inside. That's the stuff. Um, so um, if you if you if you've um, stumbled on the, on on the fourth step, if it, if you're new to this thing, it can be a lot easier than you think. Uh, if you're an old timer, I, I would just invite you to go back and check. Did did you get all of the the crap that's inside that that needed to come out? Because that's going to be the the standard um, that I that I judge my fourth step on it on. Not that it was so perfect and complete, and I got my one column right, two column right, three column. No, 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 no. It has to do with honesty and love and all the stuff that's blocking me. So um, I hope this has been uh, helpful for you. I really appreciate your listening to the podcast. Once again, uh, go visit our website at uh, twowayprayer.org and try to follow us on Father Bill W on Facebook. And um, I'll go out on a limb here and say, like me. (laughs) I'm learning to like myself, but if you like me, that would really, really help me uh, on my own spiritual journey. So again, hope this has been helpful. God bless. Keep coming back.